This time on Ozark Garage, we are putting the $100 eBay Turbo on the Lotus 7 replica. We're going to talk parts needed, carb mods, E85, and the mistakes we made along the way. Check it out. Are you running an older four or six cylinder engine, but still want to be a cool kid in the turbo club? This video is for you. Here's what you need. You need one of these Weber DG series carburetors that are available for lots and lots of cars. You can convert your car to this. It's easier to tune, easier to convert, and set up for boost. To connect the turbo to the carburetor, you're gonna need what's known as a carb hat. This is the only one I know of that fits a Weber DG series carb. The casting says k and I I don't think it's a real k and product because the quality's not great. So the bottom of it had to be sanded to fit, the top half didn't seal either, it had to be sanded to fit. The paper gaskets that it included wouldn't hold boost, they kept blowing out. Eventually I ended up machining the base to take a standard Velpro 2104 carb gasket for a four barreled holly composite steel gasket that is rated for boost and worked fantastic. The weird oval shaped inlet fits a standard two and a half inch silicone coupler just fine. The only other thing that had to be modified was I added a eighth inch hose barb to the underside to connect to the boost reference fuel pressure regulator. So the next thing you're gonna need is a boost reference fuel pressure regulator. And this is gonna go between your fuel pump and the carburetor. And it's gonna have a boost reference hose off of the carb hat that I showed earlier. So what this will do is as the boost pressure increases, it will proportionally increase the fuel pressure. The Weber DG series carburetor only needs about two PSI of fuel pressure. If you have two PSI coming in through the fuel inlet and eight PSI from boost, you're not gonna have any fuel flow. So you need 10 PSI of fuel pressure to overcome the eight PSI of boost. Pressure regulator needs to have a return line back to the fuel tank. Otherwise, this fuel has nowhere to go and it's gonna have a really hard time regulating the pressure. 25 PSI fuel pump is plenty. It really needs to be an electric pump uh, mechanical pumps, especially if you plan to run E85, aren't rated for E85, and the mechanical pump probably isn't going to flow enough fuel for uh, the boost that you're going to want to run. So the next things you're going to need are going to be a, a wideband air fuel ratio gauge and a boost gauge. So these two are from Innovate Motorsports. They have a neat feature that they can actually wire together and hook them up to a laptop to program the displays as well as do data logging. And in fact, this one will actually take a uh, RPM signal, but being able to see RPM, boost, and air fuel ratio all on one graph made a huge difference in the ability to tune this setup. Wideband air fuel ratio gauge reads off of an oxygen sensor. So you'll need to put a bung in the exhaust somewhere here. I put it mine right here behind the collector. Back to modifying the carburetor. The first thing you need to do, get rid of the choke. The reason why is the choke leakage comes up through this bottom plate here, 8 PSI of boost up here, and it's just all leaking out through this down below, it's not gonna do you any good. I just sealed up this hole here with JB Weld. Along with that, when you remove the choke plate and everything like that in the linkage, uh, there's a diaphragm down here to open the choke, so I sealed that up with some JB Weld also. I ran this carburetor on E85, and E85 requires around 40% more fuel volume. I upsized the main jets accordingly for E85. Calculation for Weber jets is pretty straightforward. Take your jet size that you're running currently, divided by 100 will give you your size in millimeters. 45 jet divided by 100 is 0.45 millimeters in diameter. It's an area of 0.159 millimeters square. A 55, which is two sizes up, gives you 44% more flow, which is a good starting point for E85. So the next thing you're gonna have to do is enrich in the power valve circuit. There's a vacuum diaphragm up here. It holds this plunger up under high vacuum conditions, so idle, low throttle position. When vacuum reaches zero, the plunger drops down and then pushes this little plunger down here and allows fuel to go into the power valve circuits below the fuel bowl. I drilled and tapped an access port in the front to give me access to power valve circuits down below. Each one of them bypasses the main jets here. When the vacuum drops to zero, that's also when we're gonna hit boost. That is the quickest and easiest way to add more fuel only under boost. All the fuel going through the idle jets also goes through the main jets. The larger ones will increase fuel everywhere. If you open up just the power valve circuits, 
that only increases the amount of fuel under boots. So why all this effort for E85? Well, theoretically, the octane rating of E85 is over 100. And here in the Midwest, we can buy E85 at the pump. The ethanol absorbs more heat from the intake air than gasoline does, which is really important since I opted not to intercool this setup just to keep it simple with the straight tube. The turbocharger is literally $100 shipped off eBay. It's a T3, T4 hybrid with an integral wastegate set at 8 PSI. I made the turbo manifold myself, plumbed it with an eBay blow-off valve, oil feed from a T on the oil pressure port, and I welded a Dash 10 AN fitting to the oil pan for the return. The cheap turbo is really just a placeholder to vet out the insulation. If everything worked, I could spend some real money on a Garrett or Turbinetics or something like that. By now you've probably noticed the turbo is no longer mounted on the car, and you're probably wondering why. One thing I did not install was any kind of timing control, and the E85 let me get away with it for a long time. As I mentioned before, E85 is widely available at the pump in this area. The problem is it's not available at every pump. I like to drive this car a lot. I'll daily drive this in the summer when it's not raining, and there's no E85 station on my daily route. So I found myself having to travel 15 miles round trip with a jerry can in the passenger seat. Eight gallons of E85 doesn't last very long when you're addicted to boost. And believe me, I was addicted. I was 16 years old again, leaving parking lots sideways. I even had to install a Holly Hydra mat to keep the fuel tank from cavitating on launch. The $100 eBay turbo dream was definitely a lie. The E85 situation started to annoy me, so I converted it back to regular premium gas. On a hot summer day, it detonated trying to pass somebody on a two-lane road. By the time I got it home, it was down on power and blowing oil out of the breather everywhere. After tearing down the engine, I discovered broken pistons in cylinders two and three. After overhauling the block, I started planning for things like an intercooler and timing control, and then just stopped. I decided the money would be better spent doing an engine swap to something more powerful from the get-go than this antiquated 20R, 22R hybrid that has 100 horsepower. Thanks for watching Ozark Garage. If you like this video, hit that like button. Post in the comments if you'd like to see a more in-depth carb tuning video, and be sure to subscribe to see more of my projects and upcoming videos.